Ilmu Plus Plus, an initiative by the Malay Heritage Foundation. I am Sharil, and I'll be your host for today. Well, we have the opportunity to hear ideas and perspective from our generation on how arts and cultural heritage can be an important bridge and social glue to foster deeper understanding and cohesion among Singaporeans. But before that, allow me to treat you with some pantun. Sungguh indah bila dijeling buat si putera jadi tertawan. Jangan pernah kita berpaling. Mari kita teguhkan perpaduan. Malu putera beri senyuman. Mengharap si idaman mula menegur. Marilah kita pesan berpesan kerana perpaduan negara masyur. Okay, um, the pantun that I wrote is actually about um, the community being together, uh, cohesion. Yeah, so I, I guess that's the more the most important uh, factor these days. And ladies and gentlemen, please join me to also welcome Dr. No Sharil, Chairman, MHF Board of Directors, MHF Board of Directors, and other MHF Board of Directors, our partners, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Today's event here at National Library marks another important milestone in MHF efforts to engage and empower our youth and connect them to their cultural heritage. And I'm sure most of us are eager to start this Sembang session. And by the way, the Malay word for Sembang usually refers to more chill, chit chat session kind of style. And among the youth, especially they will say, Yum uh, Sembang Sembang, okay? And while the topics may sound a bit atas, let's remain chill, okay? <laughs> Relax and enjoy what our speakers have to share. So first up, ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Mr. Jamal Mohammed. <laughs> Mr. Jamal will share some methods on how MHC grew an audience through nurturing heritage ecosystem and how that audience today has taken on the added roles as volunteers, partners, ambassadors, donors, advisors and content creators for the centre. He is also Senior Manager Programs at National Heritage Board, Malay Heritage Centre. A recipient, if you may, please correct me if I pronounce this wrong. Erasmus Mandas Scholarship in year 2008, the Go Choktong Youth Promise Award, and the National Arts Council Overseas Bursary. Jamal strongly believes that Star Wars, listen to this, Star Wars and Star Trek fans should really try to get along. Really a bold statement there, okay? And so once again, a round of applause and let's welcome Mr. Jamal. Hello. Um, okay, let me set my timer so I don't go over time. Um, hi, uh, I'm Jamal. Uh, before I start, I'd just like to say that, yeah, I'm still currently, uh, I'm actually the outgoing senior manager of programs at the Centre. My last day is next Tuesday. So uh, what I will be sharing with you is um, my experience with the Centre in the past uh, 11 years, since 2011. I joined uh, Malaysia Centre in 2011. And I wanted to share uh, what it means to uh, it grow an audience, right? Because when we first took over uh, in 2011, we had a re redevelopment. Uh, we had to come up with new plans. So it was actually really a blank slate, right? Um, I'll provide the context of what the Malay Heritage Centre is, if you're not familiar with it. And then I'll problematize a few things before I go on to uh, how we came about to come up with this strategy. Is this thing on? No, it's not. Okay, now it is. Ah, yeah, okay. Um, so if you go to the Malay Heritage Center's website, um, this is what you will find. Uh, so it was officially opened by Prime Minister Lee Hsien Long in 2005. The Malay Heritage Center provides wonderful cultural exposure. Notice wonderful cultural exposure. Okay, not just cultural exposure. It must be wonderful. <laughs> uh, and learning opportunities for visitors of all ages and interests, okay? So it's a heritage center that is for everybody, 
right? Everybody, no matter what your experience with heritage is, the centre needs to be able to attract you, okay? So situated amidst the Istana Kampung Glam, how many of you have been to the Malay Heritage Centre? How many have not? Okay, after this we're going. <laughs> no, it's closed, yes. Uh, okay, so situated amidst the Istana Kampung Glam, Gadong Kuning and the surrounding Kampung Glam precinct, the centre acts as a vital heritage institution for the Malay community in Singapore. Right? So it's vital. Uh. Not only is it vital, uh, we're probably the only heritage centre for the Malay community. So it's even more vital then. So through its exhibits, programmes and activities, the centre hopes to honour the past while providing means for present-day ex uh, expressions. Um, what does this mean? Right? So, of course, primarily we're a museum. Uh, but beyond a museum, we're also a, a living space. Right? So, uh, cultural practitioners, arts groups and all that should have a place within the centre. I once met a friend who asked me, like, why, are we, why do we have a Malay museum? Because right? uh, his perception of a museum is things that are dead. Right? It's gone, it's past. So there are no more Malay people, that's why we have a museum for Malay people. Um, and I thought that was a very problematic uh, thinking around what museums are. Uh, I think it's perhaps a very archaic perspective of what museums can be. And, but it also made me realise, oh, is this how people think of us? Is this how people see it? Right? Is, it is that why we have uh, museums? To celebrate things that are gone. Uh, but then we have this thing about present day expressions. So that gave me a bit of hope, lah, right? So my, my bosses back then uh, in NHB, they saw that there was a need to go back to the past and make it relevant today. Right? How, how relevant? Uh, we have to decide, lah, right? Um, not we as in Malay Heritage Centre, but we as a community, as, as Singaporeans. Right? So through the Malay, the Malay Heritage Centre is presently under the management of National Heritage Board and in partnership with the Malay Heritage Foundation. Um, I'll, I'll pause right here, I'll just give you a bit of, uh, con I'll provide a bit of context. MHC actually opened in 2005 under the management of the foundation. Um, at some point, I think it was 2009, uh, discussions with NHB uh, on how uh, they could come together to manage the centre uh, more effectively. One of the uh, perhaps limitations of uh, operating the centre uh, during the management of the Malay Heritage Foundation was funding. Um, and I'll address this to some degree later. Uh, by and large, the museum going culture in Singapore is, is uh, still in its infancy. We're babies when it comes to museums. Right? So the average Singaporean doesn't plan, okay, this we can do, okay, I'm going to go to the museum. Uh, maybe for some, but you know, it's a very small percentage. And if you zoom in on the Malay community, this number is even smaller. The average Malay person perception of museum is, you know, it's perhaps not as accessible. Um, my mom uh, never stepped foot into a museum until I started working there and forced her to come. Uh, so uh, that was one of the challenges. The other challenge, uh, because funding is a challenge, um, <coughs> you, you can't quite operate on a more regular basis, you can't do programs regularly uh, as much as you would want to. So when NHB came on board, that meant that we have state funding, yay! Uh, thank you, government. So uh, this, this was actually a Eureka moment, right? So when NHB came in, it came with uh, expertise uh, for the past, I mean, NHB was formed in 1993, so it has this wealth of expertise. There were already professional museum people there. Uh, so we could hire, uh, and we could also present content uh, at, you know, with, with the available funds. And it also meant that we have access to national collections, right, which we previously didn't have. So what are these exciting, sexy Malay objects that we can put in the museums that previously we didn't have? Right? Okay, so this is our mission and vision. So mission, ta -ta -ta, what must do? Huh? Develop MHC uh, as a leading heritage institution and a focal point for the community. Uh, I'll highlight the community is who? Huh? Who is this community? Is it just Malay people? Is it everybody? Right? So we had to problematize this as well. You know, We had to come in and like, okay, who is the community, what's our primary target audience, what's our secondary target audience, and so on. And the vision, you look in the future what you want MHC to look like. Right? So it's a sustainable de destination. Sustainable means I won't run out of money, uh, which is great that we have state funding, so it is sustainable. Uh, but it also means that um, we have to do things continually. Uh, we cannot just do ad hoc things and then hope for the best. So there has to be a sustained uh, approach. There has to be a long-term plan. Right? of historical and cultural significance for visitors and the community. There, the community again, right? Yeah, so always community, community, 
throw community word like everywhere. Um, but what this community means um, in the broader sense or in the deeper sense is something that we have to decide uh, as uh, uh, managers of the centre. Okay. Um, so, what is our role? What do we do? One, custodian of Singapore Malay Heritage was scary, sir. What does it mean to be a custodian? Anybody, throw some words. Custodian means what? Authority, right? We, we decide, we dictate, we determine, we define. Mm. Can I do this? Can my team do this? Is this something that we are equipped to do? And can we do this on our own? Right? Um, do we have the expertise? We have some. Right? I know a few things. I don't know everything, right? uh, especially not about history. When I join, I, I don't consider myself a cultural expert. You know, I, my background is in theatre and film, so yeah lah, I can introduce Malay theatre and Malay film, but uh, can I show Silat? Can I be an expert on textiles? No. So immediately we know this one, we, we need help lah, to be the custodians. And also, it means we're the authority, right? So we must have the trust and respect of the community, right? So that <coughs> they look at us like, okay, these guys know what they're doing. Honestly, the first few years, people keep scolding us like, you don't know what you're doing. Uh, so we needed to gain that trust. Actually, uh, the, a bunch of retired teachers we met during a focus group dis discussion told us like, okay, you need to do this, you need to do that, you're all so young. Right? When I joined, I had full head of black hair, so I, I look much younger than I do now. Yeah, so... <coughs> um, it meant so much to different people uh, to be the custodian, and it's a huge responsibility. One Chekgu actually said, this is a jihad. So, yeah, I mean, my heart stopped, like, oh, jihad, so scary. Um, eh, what happened? Ah, it stopped working. Hello, hello. Next, please. Okay, preserve and promote various aspects of Malay culture. Uh, this meant documentation. Uh, archiving, uh, recording everything, noting down certain things, various aspects of Malay culture. How much of Malay culture can we preserve and promote? What have we already lost? Uh, what's already gone, right? Uh, and what's there? Can we capture them ASAP? Uh, educate, of course, we're a museum. We need to educate. Um, no museums in the world do not educate. So, uh, but what does education mean? Um, what kind of content do we produce that educate? Pretty much everything. Right? The moment you step into Malay Heritage Centre, you must receive information. You must receive some degree of education. And how do we measure this? Do we need to measure this? And to what degree? What entry points? Um, contribute to nation building and cultural understanding. Of course, uh, everything that is uh, <coughs> state funded, uh, especially on the um, humanities front, right? anything that is artistic or cultural has to contribute to nation building because Singapore, uh, we have this anxiety about what our national identity is. We, we've come so far, 50-something years. Well, I think this anxiety is an ongoing thing uh, because we are, uh, some would say, a migrant society. We're a multicultural society. Uh, there are fault lines. Uh, and from time to time, you read about it in the newspapers. So how can we use the centre to nurture uh, better cultural understanding and to contribute to nation building? Right? So. What is it that's shared? Uh, and what is it that is unique about our community? And those uniqueness, are they really unique? Or are there certain similar, similar strains across? Placemaking. Placemaking, because we're in Kampung Glam, we have to make Kampung Glam more happening, as if Kampung Glam is not happening enough. Um, it is, right? If you've been to Kampung Glam, you know Kampung Glam is quite happening, right? But back in 2011, perhaps it wasn't as happening as it is today. Lah. So there was a need to make Kampung Glam more vibrant, and more vibrant in a more rooted sense, right? Uh, there's a lot of Arab and Turkish restaurants there. Uh, how many Turks do we have in our population, right? So it's, it's a bit uh, of a conundrum because we knew that we needed to inject Malay cultural activities there. And our background is Majid Sultan, our background is Turkish kebab stores and all that. So yeah, there's a bit of a, a push and pull factor there when it comes to placemaking. So it's another challenge. And when it comes to placemaking, we have to work with Kampung Lam stakeholders. That's that's uh, given, right? So that's our role. We needed to be all this, and immediately we knew we couldn't do any of this alone. We can't preserve and promote alone. We can't educate alone, and we needed to um, get help. But who are going? Who's going to help us, right? Um, no. So that's the Malay Heritage Centre in a nutshell. Uh, I'm going to problematize something before I move on further in my presentation. Heritage. What is heritage? 
Uh, this is something that we had to reflect on when we first started. So we needed to ask ourselves what heritage means. What do we mean when we say heritage? Um, is it culture, traditions, practices, art forms, various art forms? Beliefs, are our beliefs also part of our heritage, our faith, our religion, our history? Um, is heritage transmittable, non-transmittable, tangible, intangible? Is it alive? Uh, can sites be part of heritage, right? Our neighborhoods, our community spaces, um, crafts, our art crafts, songkok making, uh, textile weaving, uh, cuisine, our food. Every time we talk about culture, sure got Malay food, right? Every time, sure got ketupat, sure got rendang, right? But can we go deeper? Um, it's old things. Some people say cult uh, heritage is about old things. Um, some of those old things are nice, some of those old things are archaic, uh, outdated. It's about identity, roots, uh, our rootedness to this place. It's about knowledge, knowledge from the past, uh, different modalities of knowledge. It's about memory, and when it comes to memory, it's also about forgetting, and sometimes we're looking at endangered heritage. Uh, forgotten, what have we forgotten? Right? So it's all these things, and more. Right? My list is not exhaustive, I just want you all to think about it. Next, Malay. What comes to mind when we see the word Malay? Non-Malay people, I'm looking at you. Right? Um, sometimes we struggle with this, right? the definition of Malay. Sometimes we say, oh, silat, a form, right? Um, Malay lazy, yeah? right? So we deal with this issue still. Um, oh no, it's stuck again. Ketupat. Baju kurung. Eh? Don't wear baju kurung means cannot be Malay. Eh? Malay live in Kampong. Or Chai Chi. Uh, Ramli. Malay films. Uh, next. Sarong. Hari Raya, our festivities. Every day Hari Raya, if I take a grab, someone would definitely say Happy New Year to you. <laughs> Every Hari Raya. Okay, so I knew that okay, Hari Raya is something I need to bring up because it is not a new year. Uh, Malay dance, yeah, sure. Uh, Malay food, right, just now we have mentioned it. Um, and stereotypes, we have to deal with certain stereotypes. Right? So, who is a Malay? What is a Malay? Are things we have to uh, grapple with? Is it an ethnicity? Is Malay a race? Is it a cultural identity? Can I be born, uh, ca can I identify as Malay? Right? If I were to convert, we have this term called Masuk Melayu. You, know, you marry a Malay person, you convert to Islam, you Masuk Melayu. Do you have to be Muslim to be a Malay? Mm. Is it also a linguistic identity? Is it, just a, is it a language? If I don't speak Malay, can I be Malay? I'm a non-Muslim, non-Malay speaking Malay person. Got not? Have, right? right? Uh, and is it, is, if it's a community, is it a homogenous community? A heterogeneous community? It's also a colonial term, right? If we look deeper, Malay is a colonial term. Only 3% of uh, the Nusantara is Malay. So, how come everybody is suddenly Malay, right? So, oh, oh no, I have to. Okay, I'll rush through it a bit. 15 minutes, very short. Okay, in, Sing in Singapore, what does it mean to be Malay? It means you are Malay, you are also Orang Laut. Orang Laut also Malay, Jawa also Malay, Bawian also Malay, Bugis also Malay, Bandaris also Malay, Minangkabau, Batak, Indian. Also Malay, Chinese also Malay, Arab also Malay, etc. So, who decides? Who decides what a Malay is? Right? Yeah, we're not going to answer this. I'm not going to answer this. I just want you to think about it. So now I'm going to go back to our role and remind us. Okay, so we have all these things. We have problematized heritage. We have problematized Malay. <sighs> so now how? Where do we start? Where do we start planning? Right? What kind of programs and activities and initiatives do we do we intend? So we did focus group discussions, we reflected on the past management, where, where the gaps were, and we reflected on things that were successful, successful models, what existed. Bangsawan. Once upon a time, Bangsawan was the most happening thing uh, anybody could watch uh, in Singapore. Right? Uh, so Singapore was the hub for, of Bangsawan. Why was Bangsawan so successful? You had the producers, you have stagehands, different people's crews, with different expertise. You have musicians who could play all sorts of genres. Performers, uh, not just... Uh, singers, not just actors, right? but also uh, in during the extra turns, sometimes you have circus acts, you have clown acts, 
so it's quite broad. Writers, you definitely need writers. Builders to build the sets, your props. Composers to write the music. Uh, media, newspaper articles, promoting bangsawan shows. Audiences, of course you need audiences. People who would buy tickets to watch it. Uh, who uh, this, is this audience? You need patronship. Uh, if you're not aware, bangsawan's patrons predominantly were Chinese. So the performances would have been in Malay, uh, but the theatre owners were Chinese. The patrons were Chinese or even uh, Europeans. You have designers and so on. So this is one. <coughs> so we noticed that Bangsawan was successful because of all this and more. Next is the Malay films back in the 50s and 60s. Why was this successful? We had directors, uh, even from India, we had directors from India coming in with expertise teaching our Malay directors and actors how to do things. Actors, producers, script writers, so on and so forth. I wanted to highlight um, <coughs> sorry, literati here uh, during the Malay film career because one of the things we realized during our research is that um, the, the guys in producing films were, had close relationship with the literati. So whatever someone wrote in a book published today, next year it could be on film. So those kind of narratives were, were being shared across. Right? So you have your intelligentsia and ideas being shared amongst communities. So when we looked at both these examples, what we noticed was like, they both had ecosystems. And then we realized, okay, for the Malay Heritage Center to succeed and to do all the things we needed to do, we needed to have an ecosystem. So that's when we started identifying who our various audience segments were. Visitors, of course, lowest common denominator, every people must come. But visitors across ages, age groups, different interest groups. Donors, we needed people who had objects to come and donate things to us. If, if they have money, better still. Uh, we don't, like I said, we don't have a culture of patronship in uh, Malay arts and culture, so we, we needed to nurture this, right? Arts groups, the various arts groups, everybody wanted to a platform, everybody wanted to perform, uh, but not everybody can uh, perform at the same time. So how do we engage them, who do we engage, and so on? And how do we stop making it such a stereotypical Malay performance, right? Because when you talk to young people, like, I don't want to Malay, I don't want to come. Um, I don't know what that means, um, but working with various arts groups uh, with different followings, uh, we, uh, we, we found, especially people like Nadi Singapore, they had different followings, right? So you had different uh, audience segments who were attracted to come because they wanted to watch the various arts groups. The community, again, who is this community? It's everybody, it's a lot of people. So how do we engage these various community segments? Academics, uh, to ensure that our content is well-researched, that our content is accurate and correct, we needed to work with academics. Uh, researchers, new researchers, not necessarily attached to universities. Kampung uh, Kalam stakeholders, special interest groups, uh, textile people, uh, silat people, craze collectors, uh, we needed to identify them and engage them. Uh, schools, of course, and the media. Regional partners, we needed to look at into Malaysia, Indonesia, and so on, uh, and beyond, actually. So far, we've even engaged partners in Brunei, South Thailand, the Philippines, because they form uh, part of the Malay world as well cultural institutions, volunteers, and experts. Ah, descendants. Descendants of, of course, we uh, inhabit a space that used to be the palace. Of course, we needed to engage the former de uh, descendants of the royal family. URA, SDB, other uh, government organizations that uh, call Kampong Glam home. So all these guys form part of the ecosystem that would feed Malay Heritage Center and help us achieve all those goals. So how to engage all these people? Huh? Okay, so how we went about nurturing an ecosystem? Of course, we had to create opportunities for the various key groups to be involved. Um, neighborhood Sketches were one of the first things we initiated. This was something that we, we put up. Uh, it's a monthly performance on Kampong Glam, uh, on Busra Street. So this one, immediately we engaged Kampong Glam stakeholders, we engaged students, we engaged the general public, people smoking sisha, don't want to come to museum. Uh, we put culture in front of them. They lan lan, no choice, have to enjoy it. <laughs> Um, Malay Culture Fest. Malay Culture Fest is an annual festival, and through Malay Culture Fest, we could engage different arts groups with different uh, levels of expertise, different uh, levels of professionalism, exposure, even school groups, uh, and also regional partners in Malay Culture Fest. Senu Santara was actually a platform where we engaged the sub-ethnic community groups, the Baoyan uh, Society, the Minang Society, and so forth, to create content with us, because they have the embodied history knowledge in them. So we, we, teased, we invited them, they created and crafted their own narratives. And this is actually very successful because 
you don't go to somewhere without curiosity. You need to be curious about something, right? You need to have some sort of ownership in it. So when we did the Sunan Santa, see what we noticed is suddenly all the Malays in Singapore started identifying as Javanese or Bugis or whatever. When we had the Bugis exhibition, we had the largest number of Bugis people show up. Before that, we didn't know so many Bugis existed. So it's a reflection, right? So once upon a time, I identified as Malay and then I realized, oh wait, I'm Bugis actually because you know I didn't ask my mom enough questions, but now Malay Heritage Centre says there's a Bugis community. So you come, you identify yourself, say, hey, actually go home, ask Ma, ask, ask Nene, oh yeah, actually I'm Bugis. So this is actually one of the areas where we managed successfully to sort of galvanize uh, the community to come in and contribute. Uh, not just in terms of narratives, but their objects as well. Um, gain trust of subject matter experts and donors through consultations and collaborations. Uh, so this, we did this through special exhibitions and accompanying programs. Public lecture series, every month we have a public lecture. Uh, we would invite academics or cultural practitioners to give talks. Um, we don't say we're the experts, but we'll have the experts say what it is. Lah. They have done the research on. Identify partners who share our vision and engage them. We have this uh, arts incubation program uh, where we nurture <coughs> um, up and coming arts groups to create new content uh, and challenge them because some of the arts groups don't create Malay content per se. Right? Uh, graphic artists, for example, right? uh, street artists, they would have more alignment with New York than they do with Jakarta. So can we make them create uh, artwork that uses Malay, Malay motifs and uh, designs? Uh, various platforms uh, that we provide for them, including venue support, co-presentations. Once one time we did co-presentations because we wanted people to feel welcome at the center. Invite schools to participate in program management and creation. Uh, Heritage Hunt, which is a hunt that we do in Kampung Glam uh, with Kampung Glam stakeholders and also ITE. Uh, you take over. Uh, every two years, NTU students take over Malay Heritage Centre to conduct this program in Tak Warisan. Um, these are just some examples. There's a, a lot more that we did to engage uh, uh, the various people in the ecosystem. And so, in conclusion, for us to have this ecosystem, importance of shared ownership. We need to inform our public that they have an ownership in the centre and in the setting of the context of heritage in Singapore. Uh, gain trust through responsibly handling complex matters and meeting promises. Uh, this is very important because um, if we don't meet those promises, people don't want to work with us anymore. So we always have to be on top of things with this one. Uh, there's a lot of complexity when it comes to sensitive matters, when it comes to culture especially. So how do we deal with that? Um, ensure quality of content. Nobody wants to show up for something that is of poor quality. So we, this is very, very, very important. Um, allow greater access and opportunities. Um, when we opened up, we realized more people came. Uh, people didn't come because they thought the place was not welcoming because uh, of the gates and the design and all that. So we, we had sort of an open concept uh, designed to the center and also our policies. So more and more people came because they could work with us and maintain relationships. So this is the last one. Once you have engaged those people, they started working with you, you need to maintain a relationship because let's face it, uh, there are sensitivities involved when it comes to working community, a lot of sensitivities. So maintaining relationship with community elders, uh, people with varying degrees of uh, you know, baggages is very, very, very important. So yeah, that's it in a nutshell. That's how we did it and I think uh, if you have any questions, I'll engage them later. We, we do questions at the end, is it? No, no, okay. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Jamal. And for those of you who have the answer, who or what is Malay, feel free to comment on the comment section or maybe later on during the question and answer session, you might want to share your thoughts about it. And up next, we have Ms. Meneka Gopalan. Her presentation attempts to address these questions from the perspective of a person who lived half their life overseas and the other half in Singapore. Donning several hats in their journey as an artist, educator, curator, and now director of Singapore leading and pioneer classical Indian arts organization. Ms. Meneka is multidisciplinary international artist, artistic director, and curator in the visual and performing arts film and design. With 16 years of study and work experience in the United States of America, she has pursued her passion for the arts in Singapore's government, museum, culture, heritage, education, and community sectors for the last seven years. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together for Ms. Neneka Gopalan. Hi, 
everyone. Um, I think if you see my slide here, you might recognize where these posters are from, right? Anyone can take a guess? Do they look familiar to you? Yeah. So these are typical Bollywood posters, right? So when I was younger, um, the word heritage was completely foreign to me. Uh, it didn't mean anything, actually, when I grew up in Singapore. Um, sorry. Uh, all we actually knew growing up was films. That's actually how we understood our culture. That's actually how I identified myself as an Indian, whatever that meant, right? Because uh, when you're growing up in Singapore, um, nobody actually talks about what being Indian actually is, you know? It's just sort of like, okay, you're Indian and that's it, right? Um, and just like, you know, the Malay community where you have the Bugis, the Javanese, and all sorts of, you know, different denominations and um, sex, the same thing also happens within the Indian community as well. Um, I discovered that I am part Malayali and part Javanese. Um, I only found out about this after my grandmother passed away, and I found out that she wasn't actually from Singapore. She actually came from Java. My grandfather's from Medan. <laughs> so how that came about, where they moved, how they moved around, I have no idea. And um, you know, I really couldn't care less when I was a kid, right? But all of that kind of changed when I moved to the States. Because when I moved to the States, that's when I realized um, what being non-white actually meant, what being non-American actually meant, what being Singaporean actually meant, what being Indian actually meant, and I was on that search um, to discovering what that identity was. Because for me, what I learned over the years is that so-called heritage that we talk about is actually shaped by the very things that we identify ourselves with. And our identity, in return, is shaped by our heritage. So they, they both you know, exist simultaneously in the same space, right? In an abstract way, in a very real way. So my way of dealing with it was <laughs> Uh, like every typical Indian child, uh, my parents wanted me to be a doctor. So I actually went to medical school and I realized very, very quickly that my soul was sucked away when I <laughs> was in a hospital, you know, 24 hours a day as a, as a resident. And then I realized that like, you know what, um, this isn't really working out for me. I've got to explore something else. I've got to feed my soul in some way. I've got to, I've got to really look deep within and figure out who I was, right? Who I am, who my people were. And that's when I turned to the arts. <laughs> so I've always been very creative since, since young. And um, everyone told me, you know, why are you doing the arts? It's just a hobby, right? Um, it's just a, a thing people do for fun. And being an artist, I just didn't listen to anyone, okay? <laughs> I, I was a rebel in my family. I'm the black sheep in my family, actually. So I just decided, you know what, screw that. I'm just gonna pursue whatever it is that I love, whatever it is that fuels my passion in life. And that's what brought me to basically studying arts in the US. So when I was studying art, um, you know, one of the first things that they ask you to do is to write a description of who you are and what your art is about. And I realized that I couldn't because I didn't know how to describe myself. And it took me years, and even now, if you ask me to like describe myself, I still have trouble doing that. And um, I think that's the complexity of the world that we live in, right? How we identify ourselves. So I'm just gonna show you a few of my works and I'll walk you through the journey of what I discovered along the way, right? What you see here are some of my first, first paintings where I was trying to actually digest or not digest, but kind of deconstruct the images that we would usually see of gods and goddesses in the Hindu mythology. So you have Ganesha, the elephant god, you have Saraswati, the god of uh, you know, art, and you have Kali, right? So I started exploring these things. All I wanted to do was to break it down, you know? And I came up with a series of paintings like that. And as I went along, my journey sort of moved on to working with other mediums beyond painting. I tried printmaking, I tried photography, I ventured into film ventured into printmaking, all sorts of mediums that you can imagine, because for me, it was all about discovering, discovering, breaking down, putting it back together, breaking down, putting it back together. Um, and that, for me, has been a lifelong challenge, right? And it still continues to be that way. I'm still discovering things, still learning things along the way. Um, and one of the things that I, you know, as I was 
deconstructing sort of my identity, or what you would consider an identity, I started looking at like very typical images of Indian iconography, right? Um, also typical images of what it meant to be a man in society, what it meant to be a woman in society. So I began deconstructing all these things and sort of like putting questions out there. And being in America, being an outsider, right, looking in, um, one of the things that I very quickly realized is that I don't look like any of them, right, and not many people do, you know. So then it became a question of who am I? Where do I belong, right? Um, where can I fit in, right? And, and that's what art actually sort of helped along the way. And from making works, I went into curation. Because the beauty of curation is that, firstly, you have to start with conceptualization. You have to identify something that you are interested in pursuing. You have to find people who sort of feed into the vision that you have, that you want to execute. And I found a group of artists who were all dealing with the same issues that I was, identity, and the idea of displacement. Now, what happens when you're displaced is that you're constantly in a state of being in the middle. You're in a transitory space. And that, for me, was what liminality was all about, what the ephemeral nature of how we function was all about. And that pretty much sprung forth for me, the series of works pretty much till now, where I'm constantly exploring this in-between space. And I think that's where we all sort of exist, you know, and coexist, right? Um, after being in the US for 16 years, I came back to Singapore. And I was thinking to myself, you know, what do I do in Singapore? Because uh, I'd been away for such a long time. I didn't know anyone. And it just so happened that the first job that I applied to, I took it. And that was working at the National Heritage Board with the Indian Heritage Center. So I was there for about five years. And the most interesting thing for me was that the Indian Heritage Center had not even been constructed when I first joined. So it was a blank slate. We could do whatever we wanted, how we wanted. I was given full authority. But of course, there were stipulations. There were, like, similar to Jamal's Malay Heritage Center, we had our vision statement, our mission statement, place making, you know, authority figure and all of that. And the same sort of complexities also were there. I mean, you wouldn't believe it, but like, if you go to the Indian Heritage Center, which is located in Campbell Lane, there is a signboard on in, the middle, in the front of the museum. There's one side that's in English and the other side which is in Tamil, okay? Now, how we got to even that particular thing was so complex because firstly, what languages should be up there? Because as we know, the Indian community is very diverse in Singapore. We have Malayalis, we have uh, Gujaratis, we have Telugus, we have Sikhs, you know, so many denominations, right? So many different sorts of cultures. So what language do we choose? Of course, we have to go with the official one. And if it's the official one, do we also include Malay? Do we also include Chinese? How big would this signboard be <laughs> if we had to do that, right? <laughs> that was the first problem. Second problem was, which side should face the outside towards Strangun Road, and which side should face Clive Street, which is the smaller lane? So if you go, <laughs> the first time we installed it, the Tamil words were facing Camberley. The English words were facing Clive Street. Installed everything. It took days to do this, okay? And days after, Tamil community came. They came to us and they said, why is it facing outside? Why is it facing Camberley? It should be facing towards Little India, which is towards Clive Street, because that's where the heart of Little India is. So we thought, no, never mind, it's okay. Then the other communities came and they said, why is the Tamil facing outside? Nobody will know that this is the Indian Heritage Center because it's only in Tamil, you know? So the English should be facing outside. So we changed it, right? We changed it and then again the Tamil community came and said, how dare you change it? Why, why did you listen to everybody else? Why didn't you consult us? You know, we're the reigning community in Singapore, okay? We're the majority, you should listen to us. We take place first place, right? So all of these sort of sensitivities were there. But you know, the one thing is that um, this was a learning experience for me because I never realized how much people cared. And I think that's what really, really inspired me. The care that they had to preserve their language, to present themselves as a particular community. And I didn't just see this with the Tamil community. I see this across various different communities. And that got me into 
delving deeper into the history, into the heritage, and into the research of how we all came about, how we all migrated here, how we all set aside. And I was given the opportunity to actually, you know, do some artworks for the museum, where I actually did um, some installational work with monuments. You know, we were always around Singapore, we're driving around, we don't realize these things, right? We don't pay attention to these things. And it was only after I drew them that I realized, oh, so that's Little India Arcade. <laughs> that's how it used to be. Or that's the Methodist school, the Tamil Methodist school. The first ever Tamil language school in Singapore was in a kampong hut that has now completely transformed, right? Or that's, you know, the... Uh, uh, Cindy Association House, which was one of the first houses given to a particular community, right? These are all things that I learned as I delved deeper into it and explored art along the way in some way, right? And um, the thing about museums is that obviously you want people to come to them, right? You want people to come in. And we all know, as Jamal was saying, it's very hard to get people to come into a museum <laughs> because we're not a museum going culture at all. There's a lot for us to learn as we go along. but. This is where we thought, you know what, let's bring the arts out. Let's bring the culture out as much as possible because there's no way that any publicity that we do out there is going to encourage anyone unless it's in your face, unless it's out in the streets, right? So it's kind of ironic that, you know, arts and culture and heritage is all around us, but you need certain sort of like markers for people to pay attention. So we did outdoor installations. We did outdoor performances. Um, we did, you know, so many different sort of like mural artworks and stuff just to get the community involved, just to get people involved and to get them interested. And when they came to the street, they walked in because they wanted to know more. That was how we engaged with them. That was how we actually like sort of managed to, you know, lure people in, seduce them to actually go in and understand. And when, once they walked in, they were blown away because they had no idea. They had no idea. You know, and, and that's the amazing thing, right? When you see that wonderment in people's eyes, when you see that happening across different age groups. Yeah. And um, you know, from the Indian Heritage Center, sorry. Okay, from the Indian Heritage Center, I started working on like outdoor installations because I realized that the way to really communicate about heritage to people was to go outside and to involve the community. So this was a program that we did for Deepawli one day. Uh, one year. This was actually commissioned by Little India Heritage Shopkeepers Association, Lisha. They wanted me to work with international schools to present some artworks or some variation of themselves, a symbol of themselves, and place it in Little India. So I went to all the international schools in Singapore and basically worked with the students to create their own artwork on elephants. And of course, elephants are very symbolic, right? In the Indian culture, everybody knows that elephants, peacocks, you know, the, the usual sort of stereotype, right? But, you know, the kids loved it. And it actually made them come into Little India, which they never did before. So they got to experience Indian culture in some way. And I realized that the arts were the channel. The arts were the, the pipeline to making that happen, right? Because you're not bounded by language. You're not bounded by anything, really, with the arts. You can express anything you want. From there, I started delving deeper into the his history of, of the community, of the Indian um, uh, history in particular. And uh, there was this project that I did. It's, a, it's an outdoor street theatre project called Project Rukor, which follows the story of what happened to the women during the partition period. Now, a lot of people in Singapore, um, especially within the Indian community, don't really care about what happened in India because to them, they're so far removed from their roots. They're so far removed from their country. But when we did this play, majority of them were Singaporeans, and they were all sitting there, and they were shocked, and found that sort of like shared narrative in watching this particular play. And that was the whole point of doing it in the first place, is that we're all connected. We all share the same stories, right? Or similar stories. Which brings me to CFAS. CFAS is uh, the Singapore Indian Fine Arts Society, where I currently head. And um, you know, the, the problem about heritage uh, there are many problems. But the problem about heritage is how do you preserve, how do you promote, how do you make it sustainable, right? How do you grow towards the future? And at CFAS, we completely reimagined our whole ecosystem because we realized that in order for tradition to survive, you have to change. You have to revamp, you have to evolve. 
So for us, there are two wings. We have the CIFAS Academy, which teaches. You can appreciate the artworks, you learn, you train, which then delves into the productions wing, where you get to produce, perform, and watch. Not only are you an audience member, but you're a performer as well. You're a producer as well, you're an organizer as well. And that's the so-called virtuous circle that we actually present um, with whatever we do, right? So speaking of communities, in order for the traditional arts to survive, we realized that it wasn't just important to produce good content out there. We needed to be, we had a, a bigger responsibility. The thing about CIFAS is that we're 74 years old this year. We've been around <laughs> since 1949, right? Um, we've had over 50,000 graduates, okay? We've produced over 100,000 performances. We've traveled all across the world. We've, you know, we, till date, we have about 275 programs that we do in a year, okay? There's only 365 days, eh? <laughs> so you can imagine what I'm doing every day <laughs> in CIFAS, right? But we realized that the responsibility of an Indian traditional arts organization was far greater than just about the arts. It was about bringing communities together. It was about bringing an umbrella and having that, that sort of, you know, being a champion in a way for heritage, right, to, to, to grow, for people to understand where we come from, what we do, what we love what we like to enjoy. So this is just a breakdown of some of the things, people that we work with, right, that are part of us. We have our alumni, we have our volunteers, we have our arts industry partners that we collaborate with, we work with educational institutions, we work with different ethnic community groups. There are over a hundred Indian ethnic community groups in Singapore, okay, and each of them has their own organization, <laughs> all right, so you can imagine how many emails I have to send if I have a program. Okay, we work with government organizations. We have to partner with them. Obviously, that's where the money is. Uh, media partners are very important because they help us disseminate information. We work with um, community organizations, people's associations, high commissioners, and then we have international partners as well. So this is pretty much the, our, our stakeholders, I would say, right? And that's, that's pretty much what we, you know, that's how we survive. That's how we can sustain ourselves by bringing these people together and spreading the arts in that way. And just to, I don't know how many minutes I have left, but just to just go very quickly, <laughs> um, you know, we talk about presenting a very diverse platform. How do, you, how do you make traditional arts exciting? How do you make it, you know, enjoyable for everyone? How do you get your own people, your own people in the Indian community to come and actually watch traditional arts? Because when they see like, you know, a Carnatic music presentation or a Hindustani music presentation, a lot of them would just be like, what the hell is this? I don't understand. But the moment they see a Chinese guy on a tabla, suddenly it becomes of interest. Suddenly they pay attention. Okay? It's a very funny thing. You know? So we started jumping on that bandwagon. We got students who were Chinese. We got students who were Malay. In fact, if you see this picture over here, we have uh, Tony Macrom, who is a professor in NUS for music, who is a Mrithingam player and he's, a, he's like pretty much a professional right now, having studied in CIFAS. To the left, you have the head of Nadi Singapura, who also learned Rhythm and brought his Malay music and drums into Indian music as well. So constantly, there's a learning that's happening within the community, inter and intra as well, right? Um, we've got alumni that we are constantly working with. Now, they're all like full-fetched professionals in their own way, but they come back, they give back to the society in whatever way they can. We have volunteers who are very dedicated, who love taking pictures in saris and stuff, but you know what? Why not, you know? We need the help, <laughs> okay? When we talk about diversity, right, we work with all the different ethnic community groups, we present programs with them, they share their culture with us uh, through a series called Unity in Diversity. Another example of what we do is, you know, partnerships in the arts industry. We are partners with Esplanade now for the last 15 years. So we're constantly performing in their spaces. And that's great because they reach out to a different audience that we might never be able to. And that's one of the goals as well in, you know, promoting heritage and growing that in some way. We've also collaborated with La Salle. We've collaborated with UWC. We've collaborated with NUS, doing lots of programs here and there, right? And uh, the goal to reach out to a wider audience through our media partners, 
um, working with People's Association, performing in Chingye, performing in festivals, national festivals. You know, the, the point about serving the community too, we're not just reaching out to youths, but also the seniors, um, youths at risk. We work with SINDA quite closely as well. So there's constantly, you know, some kind of exploration going on so that we can actually build a community and spread the word and get people interested. Um, we've done, you know, digital productions. We've worked, we've collaborated with different museums, including Indian Heritage Center, Malay Heritage Center as well. Um, even uh, working with international partners, you know, because the thing about arts is that it's quite political and so is uh, heritage. And these are the people that actually dictate the kinds of things that money can be used for. So it just bodes well for us to actually be in collaboration with them, to work closely with them, right? And um, of course, the thing about the arts is that there are artists everywhere, so we're constantly collaborating with artists internationally too. And um, you know, we've developed things technology-wise as well because we realize that the way to reach out to the youth is through technology, so we've got an app. We've also got a virtual museum that's coming up as well. And uh, till date, thanks to COVID, um, we've produced over 160 original content, um, not just on YouTube, but on several other media channels as well. Right? And all of this, the whole point, if you see the reach here, the 100K, is just to spread the word. It's just to put it out there, you know, what we do and why we do it, and to get more people having that eyeball, that interest, that visibility, right? And um, in a year, some of the big things that we do, and we're gonna be celebrating our 75th year anniversary very soon, next year actually, so we're working towards that. We've got an early childhood program also that's coming up for kids who are aged four to six that exposes them to the arts from a very, very early age because as you know, the arts always comes as the secondary thing once you get to school, right? Um, and uh, we're actually gonna be moving from our campus to a new campus on Middle Road. So lots of things that are coming up ahead, but we also have this major festival that we do every year. This year it's happening in April. Um, it's a, it's a two-week festival of Indian arts, and we work with lots of communities to bring this whole festival together. So, you know, the, I guess the point that I'm trying to make here is that um, I have found that the arts is really the gateway to preserving heritage, right, and to promoting it. And when I say art, it could be anything. You know, it's, it's open-ended. It's just a way for you to pique your interest, to pique your curiosity. And I think that's where it's, it starts before it becomes into something greater. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Menika, for that wonderful uh, insights and, of course, presentation. Uh, one thing that I learned from her is that it's important for us to find out our identity, only then we can move forward. So that sentence of her really impacted me just now. So thank you very much. And our next panelist, ladies and gentlemen, her name is Ms. Michelle Lo Wen Han. Michelle will discuss the outlook towards the preservation of Singapore as one people and use super diversity as a possible lens to describe Singaporeans, our heritage, and building new legacies as we move forward in the post-pandemic era. She's a lecturer at the School of Creative Industries, University of the Arts, Singapore. She is awarded a LaSalle AQF Full Academic Scholarship for the PhD studies on evolution of multiculturalism and cultural policies in Singapore. She is a bilingual arts manager and a researcher in arts management cultural policy, diversity, audiences, music, and the traditional arts. She also serves on the executive committee of the Poetry Festival Singapore and organizing committee of the Biennial Singapore Literature, Literature Conference. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Miss Michelle. Thank you. So, who? is a Malay, and who is an Indian, and who is a Chinese? I think these are questions um, that really connected all the three talks for today. Um, and I draw my perspectives as an arts manager, and also as a musician myself, 
um, by looking at cultural policies that our two speakers have talked about, the arts, heritage, and anything related to creating a culture and an identity of a Singaporean. Um, and I hope in, in this short session, um, we can look at one new terminology that can possibly replace or, or expand the understanding of what is multiculturalism in Singapore. Um, so I start with two charts, which is looking back at our, our archival documents. So these, um, these charts were taken from population census done during the colonial period. And if you look at the left-hand side chart, um, that's Appendix A, ethnic classification in the census of the Strait Settlement and the federal, Federated Malay States from 1871 to 1911. Um, you will see many different racial and ethnic categories, way more than the CMIO categories that we see today. And then on the right, we see another chart taken from an earlier source. This is from 1824 to 1832. And in this chart, we see one, two, three Chinese, Eurasians, Europeans, Indians, Malay, others. One, two, three, four, five, six racial categories. So how did we come to be defined as such? Well, we were defined as such because of the need for a population count. Um, our British colonizers needed to report who were staying in Singapore and also the rest of the street settlements. And it is easy um, and I guess convenient to categorize people according to our nationality, according to our race, not nationality. So in this chart, 1871, we had more than 40 racial categories, and which is more detailed, <laughs> more detailed than the CMIO that we have today. It is only with the racial categories from the 1800s all the way to um, PAP took over the independence of Singapore state that racial categories were condensed further into the current four racial categories of Chinese, Malay, Indian, and others. So that is how our racial categories were originated, and that is how we came to be defined and known as a Chinese, a Malay, an Indian, and others. Now, what do cultural policies then say about multiculturalism and preserving Singapore as one people. Um, so I take reference from all the cultural policies that were studied, researched, and published by the National Arts Council. And over here, um, in a very condensed way, on the right-hand side, you will see the evolution of cultural policies published by the National Arts Council. And our first published cultural policy was in 18, 1989, that is the Advisory Council on Culture and the Arts, otherwise known as the ACCA. So in, in the first arts policy, um, the main concern were not about race. It was about setting up cultural infrastructure, setting up the National Arts Council and institutions that looked after arts, heritage and culture in Singapore. So there was no focus or demarcation of what is a race, or segregating races and managing us by our race. No. Um, in fact, the first three policies were focused on developing arts and culture and identity as one people, as one collective Singapore. The first policy was divided according to the type of arts that Singapore had. So we had one report on performing arts, one report on visual arts, one report on heritage, and one on literary arts. And then we come to the year 2000, and that is when I think a lot of us are familiar with the RCPs, the Renaissance City Plans. And again, in these reports, there were no segregation of race. Um, the arts were known as the creative industries uh, in, this, in this era, and we had arts developing to include things like digitalization, um, creative media, fashion, design, even software programming. So there was no 
there was no segregation between cultures nor ethnic or racial groups. And then our third cultural policy, um, the report of Arts and Culture Strategic Review 2012, aims to cultivate a nation, right? a nation of cultured and gracious people. Um, and this, there's a tagline that is quite famous, to bring arts everywhere, every day, every time, right? Everyone, everywhere, every day. So that is the ACSR. The first three cultural policies were focused on delivering a Singapore that is cohesive, uh, a, an identity that is collective, and one that embodies all our unique identities, our multi multiplicities. Arts and culture and cultural policies were focused more on intangible aspects like social cohesion, um, the quality of life, deepening intercultural sensitivities, and really developing a unified Singapore. The arts plan right now is um, 2018. And again, it emphasized how arts are channels for intercultural experiences, for the social good, and for the social capital. And right now, in 2023, um, I think everyone knows and if, if you don't, there's a website at the bottom. Um, Singapore's sixth cultural policy is being developed right now. It's called the Arts Plan 2023 to 2027. So I'm, I'm not doing an advertisement for NAC here, but they are right now receiving comments and suggestions um, of what you think can be improved for the arts. So Singapore's cultural policies, in a nutshell, do not and did not and do not use CMIO multicultural construct, even though the CMIO multiculturalism is one that we identify with. Um, cultural policies also do not segregate art forms by ethnicities and also did not cultivate the promotion of any particular ethnic art forms. So these are all published in our policies. So that brings me to my lecture today. So hearing from our speakers, and I personally also, um, also can understand the diaspora and the multiple identities that each one of us hold. So we are not just one race or one people because we have been to different countries. We speak different languages. We have probably stayed in one place, studied in another, and now based in Singapore. We have different identities. We have digital identities. What you have online on different platforms could be different from the identities that you have at the workplace. We have also multilingualism. People are often surprised, um, just like Minata said just now. When I was studying in London, people are surprised that I can read, Chinese, read English. Right? Um, people would come up to me in, in the bookshop and ask, hey, you're Chinese. Why are you doing in borders? How come you can read English? So these are very stereotype um, characteristics of a person and how our di identities actually reflect a certain expectation of what society has of us. But in reality, we are more, we are more, than, uh, we are more than just Chinese or Indian or Malay. We also have multiple citizenships, migratory status, and visa statuses. Um, and in the, in, in the midst of all these different diversities, does multiculturalism still exist? And can it still be understood in the same way as, as we know it as CMIO? So with increasing mobilities, there is increasing access. And by mobilities, I mean physical mobilities as well as digital mobilities. So we have access to internet right now, which is so, so easily uh, achievable. Um, you have free Wi-Fi everywhere. And in certain countries, the entire nation is wired up for free. In Singapore, sometimes we need to pay, but hey, you know, we have access to information like we've never had before. So all these bring about new mobilities across information channels, across who, of course, how we know who we are, and also across traveling geographical borders. 
So as mobilities widen and as this increase, it also widens our own individual diversity. And so I'm going to introduce a term called um, superdiversity. It's not new by me, um, but it's coined by Professor Steven Vertovec in 2007. Superdiversity has been used as a springboard across different social sciences and humanities subjects, um, and is used to discuss new methodologies to understand complexities in issues of migration, social identities, social formations, and social linguistics. So, Social uh, superdiversity is a concept, um, not really a, a term, but a concept and an approach that illustrates this need to go beyond what we know before. So what we know before is multiculturalism, CMIO. Superdiversity could be a possible lens to relook at what is a race and what is an identity. So we can actually have this space to discuss and move beyond ethnic representations. So superdiversity recognizes um, the coalitions of factors such as immigration trends. Um, there are different immigration trends now versus 50 years ago. We typically in Singapore receive migrants from main countries like China, India, Indonesia, Malaysia. Right now, the immigration trends have gone beyond our usual countries. Countries of origins have also changed and expanded. Multilingualism, multilingualism is now very prevalent in our society, not just with people who are born and bred here, but with people who bring in with them new experiences and new multilingualism from their experiences elsewhere. There are also different religions, um, diverse religions, the ones that you are born with and the ones that you acquired as you go through education and as you go through life. There are also many different types of migration channels because I'll go on to show you in a slide later um, that you, you can have an S pass or an employment pass or right now we have the 30,000 per month that's super pass uh, for, for expatriates. So many different types of passes that determines a person's migratory status in Singapore. All these with complexities in gender add to an individual's diversity. So to clarify this term, super in super diversity, it doesn't mean like powerful. It means superseding. It supersedes what it had been before. Um, it's not about uh, something that is stronger or more, but something that exceeds previous data. So I have an example here between new and old data. So a new data could be something like this. 80% of Filipino migrants in UK are females working in the healthcare. So this is a new data um, that UK has. They know exactly how many percent of workers in healthcare come from which country, and they also know the gender of people coming from this country versus an older data that is 40% of healthcare workers in UK came from Philippines. So with new data and new mobilities, you have access to increased data, even more detailed than what we know previously. So this supersedes the old knowledge that we have, that healthcare workers were mainly from overseas. It supersedes that we know healthcare workers come from Philippines. On top of that, we know that majority of those who come from Philippines are females. Right? So these are data that are new, that supersedes older data. So there are new migration data, new gender patterns, new locations of migrants, um, and this, this has um, caused, caused discrepancies in how policies have been formed. Policies are used to the older way of definitions. So what is a migrant? What is gender? What is Chinese, Indian, Malay? I'm proposing that super diversity could be a new term to look at all these issues. So superdiversity does not mean this. It does not mean that there are more migrants from more places. It means that right now, the migrants that come and the information that we have supersedes what we had before. It also does not mean that we have more ethnicities now um, because we have a lot of ethnicities in Singapore, but even in 
colonial times. We have the current um, diversities back then. It may not be captured fully in data, but now we do. It also does not mean that we have plurality of more minorities. These are all still existing. So I'm proposing that super diversity can be a new terminology to describe and to acknowledge and to read cultures now. All of us come with different identities. And I'm very happy, really, to be here. And I learned so much from the talk by Minata, Minaka and also from Jamal, um, that our, our identities is more complex than what policies have. It's more complex than what a term means. What is a Malay? What is a Chinese? So I give you an example here about Chinese in Singapore. Chinese in Singapore, we've been here many generations, and your identity as a Chinese here is different if you are first generation, second generation, or third, right? The longer you stay here, the more rooted and the more Singaporean you are. And in the, in the case of Chinese, we also have many different dialects. Teochew, Hakka, Hokkien, Cantonese, and so on. All of us have our individual ethnic identities. On top of all these, we also have Chinese who are new citizens. They just converted. We can't say that they're not Chinese, they're Chinese too. But they come with different experiences and different languages. The language that's spoken in China now is different from what's spoken in Singapore. And what is spoken in China is different between Beijing, Shanghai, Henan, and so on. On top of that, all these Chinese who come, come with different work passes, right? Some come with the new pass, the overseas networks and expertise pass. So that is the new one that's 30,000 and above. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> and then some come with the employment pass or the S pass. Some come with migrant workers pass, uh, work permits, dependent passes, holiday work visas, and so on. So all these contribute to a person's identity. How long are they going to stay here? Are they, are they counted as a Chinese in Singapore? Each person who comes would have his own unique digital, migratory, ethnic, religion, race, and gender identities. So Sing Singapore's CMIO multiculturalism is an ethnicity-focused approach. We are looking at racial categories according to a population census uh, that was proposed by the British many, many years ago. And this population census it is, um, is a way of how the British reports population from Singapore back to uh, Britain. So these racial categories are within conventional approach is within the conventional understandings and definitions of what is a race. Superdiversity can be used as a lens to understand peoples and to provide the canvas to acknowledge new processes also. So new processes of migratory status, new processes of education, gender and digital identities can be discussed within this new frame. So I end my talk over here today, and I look forward to your questions and discussion later. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Michelle. So I guess it's really important for us to keep up to date uh, with the latest data and all of that in order for us to keep on moving. And you have heard from all the three speakers. Uh, let's give them another round of applause, please, ladies and gentlemen. And now it's time for the questions and answer session. To help us moderate this session, I am pleased to invite MHF first Tuna Suarisan recipient, Ms. Shaza Isha the Managing Director of Theatre Ekamatra, a local theatre company established in 1988, graduated with a Master of Arts in 2019 from the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama, United Kingdom. So for those with burning questions, 
now is the perfect time to ask. We have microphone now, roving over. Yes, yes, right over there. And when we when posing a question, please be respectful and identify yourself. In addition to this, we have also made a veil slido. Yes. So we go to that page. Okay. For those who prefer this mode, you may scan the following QR code to submit your question. And uh, please go to slido.com and input code 409652. I repeat, 409652. Without further ado, over to you, Miss Shaza. Um, thank you so much for the incredibly illuminating presentations, everyone. Um, I'm going to take Simbang very seriously and let's keep it super chill. So please ask as many questions as you would like. Um, and I imagine there would be many. I have a lot, um, but I'm going to pace myself first. So while you hopefully are putting your questions at Slido, I actually wanted to ask if, we, if I could ask you, Michelle. Um, I looked at the ethnic... Uh, the population census and ethnic classifications and I don't know if you noticed um, but at the top it says Europeans and then in the other one it says Chin was it Chinese first and then Europeans, Eurasians, so on and so forth and I was just wondering why because obviously it doesn't make sense alphabetically is there a reason <laughs> why it was that way? <laughs> it is is definitely not alphabetical and if you notice it's not by majority either because my, by majority Malays were actually um, the highest majority population in both senses but Malays were not um, written right on top so there were scholars um, that, that think that um, these census were produced for the British so they put their, the <laughs> this guy nodding his head at me <laughs> So there, um, scholars criticised that these were of British imperialism and they put Europeans and their own people right on top. Um, it, could be, it could be that... Um, so scholars criticised that it is for the reporting that they want to report themselves on top of the list followed by those who are closest to them in terms of social status. So the second and third in line were actually the Peranakans and the straits born Chinese. Um, and there were scholars that criticised that people got to know the British when they were doing the population census in order to be counted and to be represented higher up on the table. So that was a very interesting, in interesting finding. Um, some other scholars also criticised that these tables were, were formed, um, not for majority status, but to just show who is of a higher social status in the street settlement. That's really disturbing. Yes, it is. <laughs> and interesting, yes. Uh, I have also a question for Manaka and Jamal. Because um, when I was listening to what you guys were talking about, uh, you mentioned navigating stakeholders. And I wanted to know how you navigate the different interests of different stakeholders. For example, with uh, the Malay Heritage Centre, uh, you mentioned the descendants uh, of the Istana, and I can imagine it might what they would want presented would be very different, wildly different from what you wanted, what the government wanted, who's putting money where. And um, for for Minaka, you mentioned you know the signage issue as well. Even something we might think is quite simple, but it's really not. How how have you navigated in the last years that you've been working in these places? So, uh, various stakeholders, of course, have uh, dif different uh, wants and needs, uh, which is why when we, we, when we first engaged, uh, before we even started work, we, we had a series of focus group discussions where we met everyone. Um, we l listened, uh, we, we heard what they wanted, and we measured it according to what resources uh, and our own bandwidth that were available. Uh, and of course, whether it, it was in alignment with our broader uh, picture, uh, our, our broader plan. Um, so if it fit in, then we, of course, could create opportunities. And if it did not, or it was um, you know, just a bit off, or if it's very strange, um, then we would do our best to communicate uh, to them what our intent is so they could understand. Uh, so let's say I receive proposal and I, I think it wouldn't work. I don't just outright reject it. Lah. I say, oh, yeah, interesting. Um, and you know, sometimes you pay, play delay tactics uh, until they forget. But uh, 
when it comes to the um, <coughs> the descendants of the uh, the former royal family, uh, it's very 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 sensitive because um, historically, uh, what happened between them and the state and how the property uh, was uh, taken over by by the government, um, it's 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 a very very delicate situation and it's still a very delicate situation, um, and the family is big. It's quite a big family. You know, so uh, we needed to figure out who's who, uh, who has claims to what, uh, who is a reasonable resource person, who's a bit, uh, you know, a bit wild in terms of their ideas and concepts that they want to improve. Uh, so uh, we handle them on a case to case basis. I think, by and large, uh, the family has been uh, quite accommodating. Uh, they've been quite understanding to what we, what we want to do. Uh, and they, you know, it took a while for us to communicate that vision. You know, so in, in the first few years, it was always suspicion, suspicion, suspicion. What you want to do? Why you take my house? You know, um, but when when they saw what we wanted to do after a few years, we 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 gained their trust. Um, actually, if you go to the Malay Heritage Center uh, in 2011, 2012, uh, even though we were Istana Kampung Glam, there are very limited royal objects in there, uh, and the reason we don't have uh, royal objects in there is because uh, the royal family were not very forthcoming in sharing some of these objects. Uh, and it's because of the history lah, between them and the state. So we, we because we come uh, from NHB, right? We, we are public servants. Uh, so they do view us as mechanisms of the state. Uh, but we are also people who serve the community. So we needed to gain their trust on that. And I think after a few years, uh, Tengku Indra, uh, very uh, graciously loaned an, an item to us for a special exhibition. And that was only the beginning and we know like, okay, there needs to be a lot more engagement to talk to them. Uh, and slowly, slowly, he, he started attending our events, he started uh, loaning items, he was very open to permanent loans. Um, but not every member of the family has objects, not every member of the family has that claim. Um, we've had some strange requests. Uh, when during when we, I'll, I'll be very candid about this. Uh, it's it's not someone I know, uh, but uh, Nora curator then shared with me. So a, a member of the family came and said, like, uh, I want to collect something that I buried on on the on the grounds. I was like, apa benda sih? <laughs> <laughs> so you know we were in construction. So we're like, okay, yeah, go ahead, dig. So we just let them dig and collect whatever it was, and. Yeah, it was pretty much. Did you see it? Of course not. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, God, I didn't God. even want to know what it was. <laughs> but yeah, so those kind of uh, a bit, you know, wow. funny requests. So yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Menaka? Um, okay, so I'll, I'll talk about the Indian Heritage Center. <clears throat> because the very formation of the Indian Heritage Center was um, actually quite interesting in the sense that uh, when we talk about stakeholders and navigating stakeholders' uh, expectations, right? The very first question that came was where the museum would be located, because it's the first purpose-built museum in Singapore, all right? which meant that it could be anywhere. Okay? And of course, you can imagine the sensitivities around that. right? Where do we identify as the best place for the Indian museum to be placed? Where do Indians congregate? And the first choice, of course, was Little India. Right, which is, um, as you would know, lots of shops. You know, people go there to eat, people go there to shop, and that's it. There is, it's completely devoid of anything artistic or cultural, right? <laughs> At least in the present times. In the past, it was quite different. Um, and then it became a question of where in Little India it should be placed. Okay, uh, Little India spans actually all the way from Sligi to Potong Pasir technically, right? But we know of Little India from Little India Arcade to Mustafa Center, okay? Which meant that Strangun Road was that prime road and the museum had to be somewhere accessible from Strangun Road. Now, we could have gone to Racecourse Road, which is just the next street over. If you all have been there, you'll see a huge field called Farrah Park right, where we could have had car parks, we could have had a theater, we could have had like a huge facility, but no, no. For the expectation <laughs> of the Indian community and our stakeholders, it had to be in the heart of Little India. So where's the heart of Little India? Campbellin, all right? So they got us a plot that actually used to be a cow shed at one point, 
Then it became a banana stall. Then it became a shop that was owned by Mustafa at one point. Then it became an empty ground for a while where the cows would come during Pongal. Okay, it's, it's a very, very small triangular plot. It's a very awkward shaped plot. It's not even rectangular, it's <laughs> triangular. Okay, and they decided at the very end of Campbell Lane, in the heart of Little India, this is where we're going to build the story of the Indian community. Okay, so four stories, all right, in a very, very tight space. The architects did an incredible job. If you walk into the Indian Heritage Center, you won't realize how small it is. They were geniuses, okay? They, they, they made a miracle out of the space that was given to them. The second thing was is that the museum was supposed to be a reflection of the Indian community, of the Indian history, our stories, our migration patterns, et cetera, right? Um, and within the Indian community itself, we have hundreds of different ethnic community groups. So how do you keep them all happy? Um, we had several, several feedback sessions um, across the board with teachers, with educators, with government agencies, you know, government bodies, with community leaders. And for a lot of them, they really wanted their community to be represented. Um, and a lot of them were shooting for, I want a section here on the Malayalis, I want a section here on the Tamils, I want a section here on the Gujaratis, on the Sikhs, etc. Now we realized that in a four-story building, that was actually only open to the public, three levels, okay, that it would be impossible to do that. So to manage the expectations, the whole curation and creation of the exhibitions themselves had to be rethought. It had to be reconceptualized. And the way it's done is, you have the first sort of room that you go into. The first exhibition is on the migration patterns, the roots and roots, as you would say. Where you came from, how you came, and what are the artifacts that are related to that, right? Evidence of that particular migration pattern. Then you move into the second exhibition, which is really all about your rituals, the kind of rituals that people practice. So everything from marriage, funeral rites, birth, you know, celebrations, um, uh, festivals, as an example. Um, the third exhibition is all about the industries, your workforce the jobs or the roles that several people within the community played, in particular to the Indian community. And then the last one was about the sort of renowned pioneers who made Singapore what it is, who really contributed to the community, right? By doing that, we were able to touch upon as many communities as we could, because all of them share a similar sort of, not similar, but all of them share a commonality across the board and we were able to represent them in that way, and that kept them quiet. You know, they were like, okay, yeah, I, I'm, my, 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 you know, ceremonial knot is there, you know, or, you know, stuff like that, right? Um, of course, there will be people who will always challenge that, and that's where programming comes in, because there's only so much that you can do with space and fixed objects. Um, we decided to ensure that special exhibitions would be held every year, uh, specifically dedicated to various communities. We also decided that programming would be done that way to represent the different, you know, cultural celebrations, the different linguistics, the different sort of, you know, practices, rituals, etc. So even today, you know, Pongal, for example, we have an open house, we have a Deepali open house. Um, we, we, we try as much as possible to keep our stakeholders engaged and interested by doing these sort of things. Thank you so much. Um, in the same vein, there is another question that's um, on the Slido. For Ms. Manaka and Mr. Jamal, were there situations where you wanted to do something, but the government said no? <laughs> if yes, can you share some stories? I love this. <laughs> hmm. No, I don't have. Um, actually, actually, no, I think uh, we... we because we're public ser service officers, right? Uh, there, there are certain protocols. We, we present our proposals to our bosses, that we present to our board of directors, and so on and so forth. So there's different levels to make sure that we don't uh, go beyond uh, a certain uh, uh, boundary of toler tolerable content. Um, but uh, we have encountered certain sensitivities 
uh, for certain art forms and certain uh, decisions we made in terms of how we represented some things. Uh, I'll give you two examples. Uh, one is actually a, a mural. Uh, which uh, we, we painted, I think this was part of Singapore Heritage Fest. Uh, so it was a temporary mural, it was going to be there for two months, we're going to paint over it anyway. Um, so I was working with uh, Zul, Zul Zero, uh, who's a graffiti artist. Um, so he, um, his work doesn't engage with Malay content as much, so I really pushed him to do it. So I shared certain narratives with him and he was, uh, he was very attracted to one particular story, two stories actually. One was a Shang E. Uh, about uh, Tengku Prabu. Tengku Prabu was Sultan Hussein's third wife and uh, it was about some scandal in the palace. So he wanted to paint that. I said, I don't think that's a good idea. Uh, yeah, we perhaps should not paint the scandal. Uh, uh, he's okay, let's not do that. Uh, let's do something else. So there's another story which is about uh, Wat Chanto. Wat Chanto is uh, an old man who uh, was somewhat betrothed to a younger girl. Uh, I think she was a teenager still and this was in the 1800s. And when he went to, uh, you know, he, he's, a, he's, uh, he's a Bugis man and from time to time he would travel back to the country and come back. And this would take a year, you know, like you have to wait for the monsoon. So when he came back, she married someone else already. Then he mengamok lah. And he started stabbing a bunch of people uh, along the way. So this is a very dark history, right? So it's a tragedy that actually happened. Uh, it was immortalized in a novel and later in a play. So Zul was like, wow, this is very exciting. So he painted it in the style of 1970s comics. Uh, so, I think in terms of heritage, I tick four boxes. Uh, it actually happened, it became a book, it became a play, it was done in a, uh, in a certain style. Right? Uh, but because we painted it on a wall uh, that had, uh, you know, uh, the, the family members uh, who used to live there uh, thought that it's perhaps not the best idea to put a tragedy on their wall. Is that, so yeah, we had to deal with that situation, uh, Yeah, this was you know she wrote a letter for um, it's it's all very public. Uh, <laughs> uh, another one, um, but then again, because it was a temporary mural, we painted over it and everybody was happy. But we, we met up with them and we, we spoke to them why we did it. Uh, they understood. They said next time put something happier lah. <laughs> uh, my argument was you know if you if you study Malay folk tales uh, everything is a tragedy. Everybody dies, right? Yeah. So many tragic princesses all die tragic, tragic deaths. You know, lenye batu lah, kena lenye boat lah, you know. Uh, if not, we won't have puncanaks. Um, <laughs> then uh, the second thing is, and I think this is a bit, uh, it's partly, uh, it's not really uh, something the, the state wasn't supportive of, but it was a very sensitive thing. Uh, Kuda Kepang. Kuda Kepang is a sensitive art form, right? Uh, and we presented Kuda Kepang twice before. And, um, uh, I am not someone who would censor cultural practitioners when they do their thing. Um, I told them to be careful, take responsibility, and I know Kuda Kepang from time to time, you know, it gets a bit wild. So we, we managed it as best we could in terms of security, so people don't get disturbed. We told people don't, don't wear it, don't kind of chase, things like that. Uh, but if that did happen, right, we, we had security around. So it was, it was quite well managed. The third time we staged it, I think uh, it got a bit too wild. They, they, they climbed the speakers, lah. Uh, yeah, there, there were chicken present la. So uh, the next time we wanted to do it, there, there were there were whispers that saying we should not. Um, so uh, when we met the the Kuda Kepang community, they said sorry guys, we can't do the trans this year. They were very unhappy. Uh, and if you know Kuda Kepang practitioners, a lot of them tend to be uh, kind of thuggish. Uh, this is the more marginalized uh, segment of our community who tend to be attracted to Kuda Kepang. Um, and I, I think it, it says something that they, they're very unhappy. This is their only platform that they have and they wanted to monoron. And if they cannot monoron, they will cause a riot. So I had a meeting with all the 14 heads, you know, it's all the 14 heads of the groups. I said, guys, don't do this. You know, uh, I'm very supportive of what you do. We should open dialogue. Maybe we, we, we chill this year. We try again next year. Um, and yeah, they, they agreed to it. Uh, so we did present the Kepang with a reenactment of the trans. Yeah, and we, we spoke over it. So that's one way where we sort of navigated the, the sensitivities and uh, yeah, concerns of the community and our stakeholders. There's a lot more, lah, but. Just to eat there. <laughs> uh, I think the biggest challenge is always when the topic of religion comes in. 
because with the Indian community and with most, most cultures, a lot of the art forms are, well, they began with, you know, expression of devotion to a particular god or goddess. So if we do a program, um, the biggest thing that they always tell us to be very careful about is to not mention anything religious, is to, to keep it religious free. So I think that has always been a, a challenge, and even at CFAS, it's always the same problem. I mean, how do you, how do you, devo how do you sub subtract religion from Bharatanatyam or Carnatic vocals when all you're singing is about God, right? So, but we found ways to spin it around. You know, <laughs> we found ways to like market it differently and stuff. But in the Indian Heritage Center, um, the biggest concern that I would say a lot of government officials had was about the congregation of space, congregation of too many people in a small space. Now, you guys would have obviously known about the riots that happened in Little India, right? which caused a lot of policy changes in Little India. And with Indian Heritage Center located on Cambaline, which is now pedestrianized, a lot of our programs actually take place on Cambaline itself, because that's where we can actually fit people, right? And if you're going to do a festival, if you're going to do a program, you want hundreds of people to be there. You want to reach out to as many people as possible. But that presents a challenge in terms of security, safety. I can't stop drunkards from being there. I can't stop, you know, gangsters from being there. I mean, it's it's Little India. It's a congregation for the community. It's a it's a waterhole for everybody, right? So I think that was always a very, very sensitive point. And um, there's this one particular festival that we wanted to have, which was, uh, so the thing about Indian arts, I would say, is that there is a folk aspect to it. There is the classical aspect to it. And in one particular instance, I remember suggesting wanting to do an Urumi Melam competition, okay? For those who don't know what Urumi Melam is, Urumi Melam is basically uh, a group of people coming together, playing the Urumi along with other percussion items, singing devotional songs. Now, this is a common practice at various festivals, mostly religious festivals, but the thing about the Indian community is that religious festivals are also cultural for us. You know, it's where people come together. It's not just for the practice of your religion, but it's really for socializing. And that is a very, very typical traditional way of doing it. You see it in temples, you see it outside of temples, even in people's houses when they have like prayers and stuff, they'll get an Urumi Milam group to come. And it's super hyped up music, which I thought, let's do something really cool. And if we want to be inclusive and get the youths involved in there and local Singaporean Indians to come to the space, that would be a great way to do it. But because of the connotation that it has to gangsterism, or rowdy behavior, or thuggish behavior, we were told not to do so. So I kind of like channeled it around and just got Damaru instead, which is a, a, a you know, multi-percussion group of youths. And I still got the drumming in, we still managed to get the youths in, but just in a very different way. So it's all about managing, you know, presenting the art form, but doing it in a different way, right? That would be, you know, allowed, I would say, yeah. Thank you so much. I, I'd just like to add one more thing. Um, sometimes the sensitivities would come from art forms that are performed locally. Uh, I've, I, I, I staged uh, Ma Yong Main Putu, a healing ritual from, from Kelantan, um, which also has a, 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 a trance element to it. But because it came from somewhere else, uh, it didn't face that as, as much censorship. So it's just something to think about. I think we're okay if someone else does it. Not so good if we do it ourselves. Um, is there any questions from the audience? Sam? Oh, just one question. Uh, just one moment, please. Yeah, I'd like to pose a question to Mr. Jamal. As a senior manager of the Malay Heritage Foundation, uh, which unfortunately will be stepping down next Center. week. Center, all right. Malay Heritage Center. I believe you are the most appropriate person to answer this question. Uh. I believe the MHC's vision is to develop a leading heritage center that is the focal point for the community, right? Yeah, since the Malay community comprises of people uh, with vastly different ancestries, such as the Javanese, the Punjaris, the Sundanese, I'd like to know what is being done to raise awareness and to celebrate the history of the ancestors uh, within the Malay Heritage Center. Yeah. Um, so I think I shared earlier uh, this platform called the Sunu Santara series. So the Sunu Santara series is where we focus on um, uh, a sub-ethnic community group uh, and have them sort of 
take over the crafting of the exhibition and programming for the year. Right? So this, we, we used to do a special exhibition, uh, two exhibitions a year. But when we started the Sunusantara series, we started spreading it out. So the first group we approached were the Bawianese community. Uh, because uh, the nature of the Bayanese community in Singapore is that they, they're very organized. They have a community organization. Uh, they do things annually. So we thought, okay, because they have this uh, uh, <coughs> mechanism in place, we will work with them first. And then later we, we worked with the Javanese, Minangkabau, Bugis, and uh, finally the Banjaris. Uh, this is just the first round, I hope. Uh, there are other community groups like the Bataks and so on that we, we, we would look, want to look into. Um, and when we work with the community groups, uh, one of the challenges is to what do you want? What stories do you want to share about your community? Right? What is the essence of your community that we could use in branding, we could use in marketing, that could be the, the main narrative of the exhibition? Um, so for the Bayanese community, because uh, you know, when they first came here, they, they lived in pondos. Uh, these are communal housing. So a lot of their content came from that, you know, the history of the pondos and so on and so forth. For the Javanese, it's about inheritance, Pusoko. So that became the title of the special exhibition. For the Bugis, uh, it was their, their spirit. The Bugis, the story of the Bugis is they're the very ill-tempered pirates and so on and so forth, right? Um, but that came from a certain uh, philosophy that the Bugis people hold, Silina um, Pese. So if, if you were to hurt me, I will have to retaliate to so that kind of, you know, very very uh, thank you, al almost Viking like sometimes uh, Sarafian would say, say oh we're the Viking of the East uh, very romanticized but uh, I, would, I would take some caution in that so that's how we engage them and that's how we, we share those narratives and how we broaden the definition of what it means to be Malay in Singapore yeah. thank you thank you was there another question? oh yeah Omanja oh, Hi Jamal, <laughs> nice to see you again. Hello. <laughs> and uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Shafiq. I, I mean, just a little history. I, Jamal and I actually we worked with for the Rang Banja exhibition actually. Uh, so that's why I came here. I was just like, hey, Jamal, nice to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think my question actually is, uh, I would say it's a little bit of uh, one leads into the other. So I'll just ask my first question first. Uh, that is directed to Miss Lo. Right about uh, super diversity, right? Uh, in your reading of uh, the theory of super diversity, right? How does um, oppression, you know, because if you were to read uh, the works of Mui Wationgo, if you were to read the works of, um, say, uh, what was the other guy's name? The psychologist who wrote about colonialism. What is African colonialism? Sorry? Franz Fanon, yes. Yes, yes. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So how how do how do they deal with um the emotions of oppression with um or rather how do, does it really address the emotions of oppression in that's in super diversity so that it can then be a story that's told in the, maybe perhaps uh in museums, in uh any other exhibitions that uh you that that occurs from, from here on? Super diversity is a, I think it's a super cool, open, open, um, like a blank canvas concept that allows all these discussions to take place. Another thing that I didn't talk about was about illegal migrants. So it's about identities and because it first started for migratory studies, um, it's, it's, it's really a, a, a concept for, to reflect current ideologies and current trends. Um, and for sensitive issues like oppression, it can be also included in this, in this consider it a, a canvas for you to discuss and to see how oppression is being displayed and um, activated or inform a person's identity and informing a person's um, sense of belonging of what, what and how, where he is in the world. So it is really a canvas to talk about different identities and different happenings to an individual and how these complexities in each individual make up a society. So I, I hope that um, answers your question. I'm still in the midst 
of my research. Um, I hope that I have a space to, to talk about um, how super diversity can be applied and how it should be applied in a, in a society like Singapore. Yeah, yeah actually, in fact, it actually leads into the very nicely to the next question that I would like to open up to everyone, actually. Uh, um, actually, including to Mishaza, if you'd like to answer as well. Um, <coughs> that canvas thing, right? The ideal, the ideal is that it's a blank canvas and it's unlimited. But we, as, as we all know, and it's not just limited to Singapore, but perhaps anywhere in the world, right? The ideal is a blank canvas, but then unfortunately, there will always be a scissors that will cut it out. There will always be things that will basically draw out the boundaries, the OB markers and all that. How then do you negotiate? And, and it will be bring me back to the idea of oppression because, you know, um, colonial oppression, all that kind of thing, right? And also um, that historical oppression forcing people to want to tell their stories even more, you know, because they are so emotionally driven, driven about it. How do you manage that when, as we come up with um, stories that, uh, that needs to be told or that is going to be told in these exhibitions? Any, any, anyone can st start off from that. I'll, I'll try. Um, I think one of the first challenges we, we, we face in creating content for the centre, uh, I think this might be true for what Shaza does in theatre as well, um, a myth about us that persist. Um, and a lot of the myths that exist about, persist about the Malay community um, has their roots in, in the colonial period, right? And because of um, our uh, lack of support of colonial industry or uh, insolent nature of the Malays, you know? So we, we get labeled as lazy, you get labeled as pirates, you get labeled as krong aja and all that. Um, and today, hundreds of years after that, uh, some of these things are still there, right? If you take a taxi to NUS, you, went, you go to NUS, right? Um, sometimes they would ask you whether you were in the canteen, right? Um, if Alfan Sa'ad was here, he would say the same thing. When he took a taxi to, to NUS, he was like, oh, you, you, you work there, is it? Say, oh, no, no, I'm a student. So, oh, Malay University. University. Um, so some of these things still exist. Uh, in the army still, uh, I'm, I'm, I've experienced this before, even though I'm, I'm, an, I'm a senior officer now. Uh, if I don't wear my rank, I wear a just vest slack and I'm hanging out at the near a uh, um, smoking point or Land Rover, someone would assume I'm a driver and whether that Land Rover is mine. Right? Um, so no one would think that I'm a person of rank, that I'm intelligent and stuff like that. So when it comes to uh, things like um, <coughs> identity, culture, you know, you're know, you talking about oppression, it doesn't necessarily have to be something deliberate. Sometimes it's cultural blind spots. Right, when when, when uh, Michelle was sharing about the, the Renaissance City Plan, uh, ACSR reports uh, about how it's, it doesn't paint colours on, on races, I want to problematise that. Do, are we uniform in terms of our concerns? Um, does our community give the same way? Right? Do we consume, do we have similar consumption habits? We don't. Right? So if we're going to pump the same amount of money for each community, 75% right, of us are Chinese, a smaller percentage of that, you know, 10% uh, are Malay, smaller percentage, 3% Indian, right? Do we get an even piece of the pie? And if, if we do, uh, is that enough for our community, right? Um, the Chinese community would have a stronger culture of patronship compared to the Malay community. I think the Indian community have a stronger culture of patronship than the Malay community. So if we get the same funding as the other communities and we don't have patrons, uh, how do we square that circle? Right. So I think um, while we want to exist in a world that is post-race, post-ethnicity, I think our baggage are still quite held back in the colonial period. So this, that's one of the areas that I think we need to pay attention to. And I think even if we use terms like uh, uh, super diversity, we still need to interrogate our history and our baggage in terms of how do we apply it accordingly. Yeah. Yes, um, I can add on. Um, we, while we were discussing before the talk, policies may, may suggest certain recommendations, but when it comes to actual implementations and actualizing these, um, imp these suggestions, it's not necessarily fully <laughs> reflective of what policies say. And in terms of oppression, um, yes, I can give you an example about this research project that I did for traditional Chinese music. 
Um, so we tried to document creative developments of traditional Chinese music in Singapore. And because of how traditional arts are, and in the Chinese there are different factions of uh, traditional, even though we are all Chinese music, right? But even so, within us, we have different factions. So in order to bring different factions together to agree that we have creative developments, we are self-oppressing um, ourselves. Uh, we kind of stop ourselves, hey, this is not Chinese music, you shouldn't put it in. Um, you are add adding electronics, this is not traditional anymore. So we put in the oppression ourselves, the self-censorship automatically. Um, and just bring people together was already a first step. So I think there are different degrees of oppression, um, of how each, I think each art form and each race, we kind of um, reflect different degrees of oppression, different degrees of self-censorship. Self um, and, and I think as we are, we are a super tiny nation, right? <laughs> we are small. And, and I think there is no need to, to create competitions amongst ourselves. And we should really be united, especially um, to recognize our own achievements as a race, as an art form, whatever. We should really come together and recognize it and, and to push forward together. But thanks for, thanks for that question. Yeah. Um, I think you asked a question about how to manage stories of oppression, right? I think it starts with education, right? To educate oneself and to educate others. I think that's a responsibility that museums, educational facilities, arts organizations, art practitioners, everybody's responsible in that education. Um, and if you are representing a minority group, then obviously the story of oppression is almost akin to any experience that you might have, right, in society. Okay, so one thing that I want to share is that, uh, you know, being in the Singapore Indian Fine Arts Society, there is a certain sort of representation of traditional arts being very pure, very chaste, very sort of elevated, atas as you want to call it, you know, only a certain group of people can actually be a part of it or, or learn it. There are all these sort of misconceptions along the way, right? Um, and what a lot of people don't know is the history or the origins of how the traditional arts even started. Okay, and if you were to look at Bharatanatyam, for example, it was done, it was actually originated by a group of Devadasis who were actually outcasts of society. They were extremely oppressed. They only performed in the temples. Um, and it started off that way. And along the way, somehow or other, it became uh, a Brahminical practice. And suddenly, the Devadasis were seen as bad. They were seen as prostitutes. They were seen as outcasts. They were seen as um, inferior when they were the originators to begin with. Right? From this Brahminical sort of taking over, everything about the art form became censored. They got rid of all of the things that might be controversial because they felt like they had to portray themselves as higher beings, as higher performers of this particular form. So, in fact, the, the Bharatanatyam that we practice today, the classical art forms that we practice today, is, you know, a lot of times, a lot of people can say it's a bastardized version of the origin, right? But a lot of people don't know that. It's a very controversial topic. It's also something that I'm looking into because I just came across it about two or three years ago. I didn't know this, you know. Um, it's only by looking into what research scholars are doing out there to really understand how this particular art form even evolved and how it's being practiced today. So it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to contend with, for sure, you know, this idea of oppression and how do you manage it. But to me, it's, it begins with learning. It begins with educating yourself. Thank you so much, everybody, for the questions. Um, there are a few questions that we were not able to answer, and I would encourage asking them later on. <laughs> uh, and I also wanted to thank uh, all of you. Um, I am smarter now than two hours ago, so thank you so much, and I feel like that's how you, I hope that's how you all feel as well. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ms. Shaza, and of course to our three speakers for that robust discussion. So ladies and gentlemen, if you have uh, any burning question, please uh, submit it through slido.com at 409-652. All right, and now to present a token of appreciation to the speakers, we would like to invite our MHF General Manager, Madam Julina up front. Please, <laughs> a rough applause for Madam Julina. 
Okay, first up, may I invite our first speaker for today, Mr. Jamal. A round of applause, please, ladies and gentlemen. Up next, uh, let's hear it for Miss Meneka. And also, Miss Michelle. <laughs> How about I invite uh, everyone here to take a group photo together with Madam Julina, please? Yeah, including Miss Shaza, yes. If you're watching us through uh, our social media platform, don't forget to follow us okay, on Facebook, subscribe us on our YouTube channel. Okay? And if you're snapping any photos of uh, today, please insert our special hashtag MHF, okay? hashtag Malay Heritage Foundation. Thank you very much, Madam Julina. Okay, as mentioned earlier, okay, we actually have a special project showcase I would like to share with everyone here. But first, may I invite uh, our friends from ITE College Central and also from Raffles Institution up, up front, please. Come on, a round of applause for them. Yes. Okay. Come on up. Don't be shy. <laughs> Okay, maybe you'd like to send somewhere. Okay, hold on. Our friends actually has prepared uh, special videos, in fact, a presentation that was done last year based on a special project. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, now I'd like to hand over the microphone to Madam Julina first. Uh, I know we are a little bit overrunning, but I hope uh, you can just stay for a while more to give some space to our young uh, presenters here. Uh, basically, when we started this series of Simbang Ilmu, we invited our youth to come up with a project, you know, uh, to, uh, to kind of express what it means to be beyond CIMO. This was their first project. Eh? So uh, we selected... We had, uh, we had a few engagements and we selected two projects, one uh, from uh, Raffles Institution right, and another from ITE. So we invited them uh, to, sh to at least share what they have uh, achieved so far. Is it completed yet? Not yet, right? <laughs> Still in the process. But I think what is important is we want to hear from the, from the youth themselves, uh, how do they view some of these things? You know? so, uh, and then we leave it to them in terms of how they want to present it. So uh, we just want to take about five minutes for each groups, and then after that we can go makan. Okay? So I hope you all indulge us a little bit, give them a bit of uh, time so that to encourage them. Yeah. So Gareth and team, who's presenting? All right. Oh, IT first, welcome. sorry. Re From IT College Central. <laughs> okay. <laughs> IT College East. East. Ah, ah, you. <laughs> my bad. My apologies. Okay, maybe we'd like to have the microphone Let's over use there. The microphone? Yes. And feel free to present it, okay? Once again, our friends from IT College East. <laughs> okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, we are from ITE College East. So, yeah, we will be presenting our presentation now. Yeah. Uh, today, we will be talking about uh, several iconic locations in Singapore and how these landmarks help our national, wait, our nation change through time. So, we will be sharing about how our idea can spread knowledge about Singapore multiculturalism and promote it through art. Okay, so first up, we have Haji Lane. 
Hajili named after the word Hajj. So Hajj is a pilgrimage undertaken by Muslims to Mecca and Medina. And uh, Hajilin is also known to be one of the many popular tourist attraction sites, consisting of wall arts which also attract youngsters. Other than that, um, as we can see here, this is the Sultan Mosque. Although Sultan Mosque is one of the focal points for Singapore's Muslim community, the mosque provides guided tours for the non-Muslims to learn about the architecture of the mosque and also about the Islamic faith. Um, Little India offers a lot of cuisines from South and North India are included, uh, butter chicken, biryani, and etc. Additionally, they offer a wide range of goods to purchase, including electronics, groceries, jewelry shops, and sari stores. And a lively site worth experiencing during festive seasons. Uh, next is Chinatown. So Chinatown is actually a very beautiful district and is one of the Chinatown also boosts a Buddhist temple, mosque and Hindu temple along like a single street. So around this area you will find like many hidden gems like a rooftop garden uh, with a beautiful pagoda and food court selling vegetarian cuisines. So uh, we thought of all these locations just mentioned and putting all these locations within the circle through a piece of art, um, spreading awareness and promoting to viewers that Singapore is a multicultural society which provides a conducive environment for both Singaporeans and tourists of different ethnicities and cultures to be able to welcome each other freely into their beliefs and lifestyles. In conclusion, despite Singapore having multiple locations representing iconic cultures and beliefs, all uh, and beliefs, all of these locations managed to come together to form a multiracial and inclusive society. And it also definitely allows us to have a deeper understanding and knowledge about the different practices from various religions and cultures that surround us in Singapore. So with that being said, this is the end. So thank you everyone. Uh, next group, do you want to present first? Okay, so I think at the end, what we hope to see is some kind of a map, right? That is going to be presented. So there's still work in progress. So the final thing will probably be a map that showcases some of these uh, iconic uh, buildings that represents uh, the heritage and the ethnicities in Singapore. So for uh, <laughs> this is a project from Raffles Institution. Yes, one, two, three. All right, yeah, thank you very much for the beautiful introduction. Yeah, appreciate it. So yeah, uh, I'm Sam. I'm from Raffles Institution and I have my homies, uh, Gareth and Ayman. So yeah, we're going to be presenting a pro podcast uh, called Kita Bahasa. It's actually made up of three words. Kita, which is us. Bahasa is language. And if you see the Kitab, right? Kitab actually means book. So yes, it's like an open book. You're going to be learning everything and anything there is to be learning about languages in this podcast. Uh, as you can see, the logo, right? My friend Gareth will be explaining how he created this logo. Yep. Okay, so uh, I think I based the logo mostly off of the logo of the Malay Heritage Foundation, which is, I think it used a Kufic style Arabic calligraphy, right? Uh, so I actually tried to emulate that in the design of the logo for the podcast. So I think I'll explain the, the tree. It looks like a, kind of like a maze, uh, but I guess I'll show you. In the middle, right, like this part here, right? Um, is the kitab and bahasa, but it's like kitab is here and then bahasa is here, but it's upside down. <laughs> then uh, actually, the we have like a the main theme of our of our whole like podcast is actually kepentingan dan uh, ke, kepentingan dan keindahan bahasa ibunda di Singapura. So right, uh, we have bahasa ibunda here, and then uh, kepentingan and keindahan here, but it's all like reverse la, to try to make it fit because there's like a certain style to it, I guess. So this is the the concept behind the logo. La. Okay, la. Next slide. All right, so uh, we're going to be talking about what this podcast is mainly about. It's a very refreshing podcast, as Gareth said, about kepentingan dan keindahan uh, bahasa ibunda di Singapura. Because right, in Singapore, uh, Singapore thrives on bilingualism. Everyone's being taught both English and their mother tongue, be it 
Tamil, Malay, Chinese, or NTI or non-Tamil Indian languages. But the thing is, right, what is actually done for you to realize uh, your warisan dan budaya? What, what, what is done to realize your culture? Like, okay, you're learning Tamil, that's great, but does the school actually teach you more about your culture and how you guys came about your roots? Same for Malay. Because Malay, right, I kind of feel like it's a colonial construct, the word Malay. Because a lot of people in Singapore, they identify as Malay, but if you delve in deeper, you can find out that they have ancestors from Java, the Straits of Sunda, then what else? But Bugis, Banjaris, and so on. And these students, they have to realize where they actually came from so that they can understand themselves much better and the community as well. Yep, next slide, please. All right, so the primary goal of this podcast is to explore the multitude of languages that were or are being spoken by the Malay community and to encourage the Malay community in general to keep in touch with all these languages. Yeah. Next slide. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. So uh, our podcast. Um, there's a couple of things that we plan to cover. Um, main mainly is about discussing like um, the different languages. Not really languages, but like the the variations uh, from Java, from uh, from. Uh uh, basically, we're just gonna talk about. Um, I think because um, we know of all these languages, sometimes we think of them as dialects, right, of Malay, but actually they're not lah. They, I mean, they're they're related, but separate languages. So I think the podcast actually aims to have a like generally discuss about these languages. Why are they why are they maybe important? Why should we? Uh, care about them, and also maybe that the re um, the relation these languages have with the Malay that is taught in school, which Bahasa Baku, which is which may not be actually the most natural way that Malay people speak in Singapore. Yeah. So basically, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I guess just now we mentioned like, there are many actually there are actually many um, Malay languages that are spoken in Singapore, which are like these. We got Japanese, Bugis, Sundanese, Banjaris, and more like, a lot more. And I think the, that actually these languages are a lot more representative of the Malay community in Singapore, besides the like you know Pasabaku, the Malay that's being taught in school. So yeah. Next slide, please. Thanks. Yeah. So, so that's what I think. Yeah, it's basically that. Um, and also in Singapore, like if you think about it, right? Uh, obviously we don't have all these languages being taught in school, right? Only one standard form of the language is being taught in school. So I think that this is like something we, uh, that really appeals to students as we're all like in school, right? And we have to learn the mother tongue. Do we really know what mother tongue is? Or do we know what is this, is like relationship is with our so-called true mother tongue? Or is Malay our true mother tongue? In that sense, we can ask out. We, we try, try to like pose this challenge to the viewers of the podcast and want, we want them to ask themselves. Like, um, so because they lack this in institutional recognition, right? we try to provide a platform for the languages to present themselves, maybe we can get representative from the language to come and join our podcast every now and then. And this is what we try to achieve. Uh. Uh, can I add on? Okay, so um, it's also about like raising awareness um, about these uh, different variations, especially in, in, in uh, the Malay languages. So for me personally, um, my mom is from, my, my mom's family originates from Java, but I don't understand uh, the, like, the Malay form of uh, the Malay Java. Like I can't, I can't really understand it. So, I, I want to learn and I want to understand to be able to connect with uh, my family and my relatives overseas. And uh, so I believe the Malay word is to melestarikan, is to like uh, continue and to to bring it back, uh, to revive it again. So yeah, that that's what uh, that's one of the aims of our podcast as well. Uh, okay, so then. Besides this, uh, I think we, we, I mentioned earlier that we, we don't we obviously not taught these languages in school, right? And also, even if we're not taught that these languages in school, they are also not passed down by the parents or grandparents. So after like a certain generation, like I mean, even within one or two generations, right, the language just completely disappears from every, from like the speaker. So like, it is very difficult for the speaker to actually want to learn the language, even outside of the family. There are no resources. Like honestly, how 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 are we gonna be able to come across a let's just say a Japanese textbook? Or a Bugis textbook. If you even if you want to learn language by yourself without the parents, right? So, the podcast also try to helps try to help you in a sense to learn like maybe or introduce you to the basics of the language, 
maybe in one or two episodes, we'll give you, give you some words and, and phrases to learn. Then maybe from there, it's easier for you to build up your knowledge of the language and you listen to your parents or stuff like that. La. Because they really, there are no resources out there for these languages, especially in the Singaporean context. Because maybe you think about it, maybe Bugis or maybe Javanese spoken in Singapore is different from the Javanese that is spoken in Java or in Bugis or elsewhere. La. So this is also one of the things. Uh, next slide, please. So, yeah. Okay, so basically, we use the podcast, right, as a way because we find the podcast is a, it, it kind of encompasses the simbang aspect, right? Because we all like kind of, you know, it's chill, and we get to talk about these issues in the most lighthearted way possible. I think it's the best, most sincere way of garnering attention and helping us learn more about the languages, and also at the same time, it gives a platform for people who are interested, enthusiasts, right, of the and the representatives of the language to express themselves and express their culture to a wider audience, which is maybe more like young people. Because I find, you know, young people are the people who are supposed to continue this language in the future. If it really, if it dies amongst our generation, it dies forever like, in Singapore, essentially. So we better quickly use, use a platform to start it up again. Uh, before, if not, because it after that, it will really just go away. All right, so uh, I'd like to say, I'd like to add on to what Gareth said. Uh. So pretty much, right, this podcast, uh, we are like a treasure trove of sorts because we're like the middlemen. Like, most, most of the people who know their roots, they do not have the appropriate resources to learn more about it. You know what? We will help you guys out. We will be the guys that suggest to you where you can go and learn all these uh, cool things. And we will also bring in experts, yeah, ex experts into our podcast and they will be sharing their ideas with you guys and you guys can be enlightened at the end of the day. So, yes, please, uh, we will be updating you on when our podcast is going to release. Just, you know, if you're free, just tune in like, in your car or something, yeah. <laughs> then yeah, you can listen to our great voices as we speak. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Gareth, Sam, and all that. So, okay, uh, uh, let me just explain this quickly before I hand over back to uh, Sha Sharin. Shari, Shari, yes. Um, Semak Yemu Plus Plus is uh, conceptualized differently because we added a project element because we want to invite our participants to actually submit project ideas that they can then execute and they'll be given seed funding for it, right? Yeah, so um, so for them, they will be producing uh, a series of, of podcasts covering uh, the different languages and well, hopefully they might even expand to other ethnic languages as well. So we, uh, the foundation actually kind of uh, mentors them in a way to help them in the in the process but the project ideas content is everything done by them as well so similarly for this uh, second session under the topic of recreation of heritage we are also inviting you guys you know if you have proposals uh, submit um, <coughs> your your proposal there is a website you can go to our website and download the forms and submit it and then we will review it and we will feel that uh, is interesting enough to add on we will actually give you the seed funding for it yeah. So uh, just look out for to our Facebook page, uh, Facebook for the announcements and, and details. Do encourage your friends to take part because we want to see something that you actually produce, and you know um, we help you curate some of it. But most of the time, we actually leave you to actually uh, produce the content because this is coming from you. You how you guys see the the issue as and all that. Yeah. So with that, I hand it over back to Sherry. Okay, thank you very much, friends from Raffles Institutions. But before that, we have a special video uh, prepared by them. Let's sit back, relax, and enjoy. I hope all of you are having a great day. We are proud to announce the release of our new podcast. Kita Bahasa. Yeah, my name is Sam and I'm going to be taking you through the details of this wonderful production. The theme of today's podcast is Keindahan dan Kepentingan Bahasa Ibunda. And through this, we wish to share more about the languages being spoken by the Malay community in Singapore. Let's go. Modern day Singapore thrives on bilingualism, with most children being taught both English and their mother tongue in schools. However, do you think that students really know the significance behind their true mother tongues? Do you think they are truly interested in learning about the beauty and importance of speaking their mother tongue? And if you don't, you've come to the right place. My name is Ayman, and this podcast is for you. Hi everyone, I'm Gareth. 
do you know that Bugis, Banjaris, and Javanese are actually not mere dialects and are a bunch of separate but distinct languages? I believe these languages emblematically reflect on the, cu uh, the culture and history of the Malay community in Singapore. However, these languages are not passed down enough and receive little to no institutional support. Furthermore, resources are few and far between, making learning very difficult for anybody who's interested. If you are interested about the history and culture of the Malay languages in Singapore, do tune in to our podcast. I'm Toby, and here are the other members in our podcast. Jangan lupa, the name of our podcast is Kita Bahasa, a Sembang Umu Plus Plus project. See you in the first episode. Well done. Okay, don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, to follow their podcast, Kita Bahasa. Okay, so most of you are, are wondering, how can I be part of this special project? As mentioned by Madam Julina just now, we actually uh, called for proposal. We have uh, all the information that you need here. So I'm going to just skip through because it's already been explained by Madam Julina just now. All you have to do is to scan the QR code. Okay, and then... I'm seeing some excitement already. Okay, probably a new podcast coming up soon. And then, uh, form a group between 5 to 10 members. And please visit or log into the website. Uh, at the This website is actually very hard for me to pronounce. And then uh, follow us on our social media platform uh, Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Okay? Subscribe, okay? And subscribe to our newsletter too. Nice. Okay, wonderful. All right, with that, uh, we have come to the end of today's uh, session. I'd like to say a big thank you uh, to everyone here for spending your time with us. A round of applause for all of us, please. <laughs> okay, so stay tuned and follow our social medias for update. Uh, we are now on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and subscribe to every single thing that you see just now. And once again, thank you very much. And uh, let me end off today with Pantun. Yes, because we are talking about uh, integrity, I mean integrations and all that. So this pantun has something to do with today's um, topic. Putera pemalu gembira hati kerana dara membalas senyuman. Bangsa bersatu teguhnya berdiri seluruh dunia jadi sebutan. Mulanya asmara tetap bersopan bagaikan bunga mekar sekuntum. Terus bersama, maju ke hadapan, tanpa mengira apapun kaum. With that, my name is Sharif Samri. Till next time, goodbye. So, I'd like to invite everyone for reception at the back. Yeah, bless. Uh